Good evening, everyone. It is 2024, and we are so happy to be back with you. This is our first episode of Real Talk Family Life, brought to you by Faith Tabernacle and Caribbean Evangelical Ministries. I am Sasha Sutherland, your hope for this evening, and it's the month of February. Tonight, we'll be discussing the expectation of love, how fitting. We're joined by two amazing speakers, Bishop Dr. Gavin Garraway of Glory Church, Inc., and Reverend Dr. Roger Samuel of Word of God Ministries. So welcome to the program, everyone. We encourage you to make your interventions via Zoom or our YouTube chats as we spend the next hour focusing on expectations. Dr. Samuel, Bishop Garraway, welcome to the program. All right, good to be back. Happy New Year to everybody. <laughs> yes, good evening. Good evening. Welcome. I'm so glad to be here. Happy New Year as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We're going to jump right in. So I'm going to ask you if you want to make an opening or should I just go all the way in and ask my first question? You can go all the way in. <laughs> all the way in. Lovely. So this evening, we kind of want to look at the role expectations play in a relationship, right? We're two persons who are madly in love with each other and we say we want to do life together. We want to look at the importance of verbalizing expectations because a lot of times there are disagreements because those expectations are not met. So expectations is a big word tonight and I want to ask you to start by giving us a brief description of, of this expectation and how important it is for an individual to have expectations before entering a relationship. So Bishop Gary, I'm going to come to you first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I didn't expect that one, but God is God is good. <laughs> uh, in terms of um uh we we are dealing with two very heavy things here. One love, which is the whole idea of having affection for people based upon uh familial or certain uh connections, etc. But expectation is a strong belief that something will happen uh that that something can be something will happen or should happen based upon the connection uh with that person place thing time whatever it is and um the thing about life is that we were created with the diamond with these two things in built into us God is a God of love. God is love, but God also has expectations. Um, I know this might be a little funny way to start this, but many times when people think start defining love, they start talking about unmerited as though sometimes they bleed grace or certain dimensions of grace into love. And yes, it does belong there. But even the God of all creation, who is love, has certain expectations so that when Adam and Eve broke his expectation god put them outside of the garden even though god himself was love in its perfection so love i believe is the commitment to the well-being of somebody uh, based upon certain dimensions of purpose and the reason why i say that is because again many a times in society love is defined as by people as to what they want and so say if you love me you'll give me my money and you'll give me your money if you love me you'll give this and love is many times used as a manipulative force but the Bible tells us, though I give all my goods to the poor and have not love, which means I can give people and I can meet their need, but it still is not love. So I see love as connected to the divine purpose in that. Now, of course, there again, as I believe as we go into the teaching and as we go into it, we're going to find there are different words in the Greek and different languages. And I'm sure um, Dr. Samuel will help us with that. The different meanings of love. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. But um, I believe that the divine love has an expectation connected to for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that who shall not, who will believe in him will be saved but he did, um, and will not perish. Forgive me for not quoting John 3.6. I don't know what happened to my brain this evening. <laughs> like everybody else, I had a, a little unexpected something that happened that happened this evening and I had to rush in. <laughs> Right, so I was I was still drop drop bringing my my uh my adrenaline down. <laughs> so God, yes, He loves the earth, and yes, He gives the greatest gift that is, etc. But He has an expectation 
And I think one of the things that, and I don't know where, what is the total belief structure of everybody now, but a, a lot of preachers are starting to walk away from, they don't believe in judgment, etc., because they think a God of love cannot judge. You understand? But love carries expectation within it. You understand? And the greater and the more perfect that love is, the more just the expectation is. And I think when we get into the area of relationships, we have some basic expectations that should be, and it is perfectly okay for us to, to require. And I think part of the reason why we are having so many failed relationships in this day and age is because people are not prepared with understanding as to know what are the contrary or seemingly conflicting. In other words, there's something that men like, something women like, and some things your woman like or your man like. And I think we're going to, I think in part phase three of our thing, we're going to get into that where we look at the counter expectations, etc. But the whole aspect of love and expectation, I believe, um, I mean, as I said, Pastor Anthony is always a great place when it comes to topics and outlines, etc. And the team working with him. So I, I love the way this is put together. So there's love, but there is expectations that comes with the whole aspect of love. That's my opening salvo. <laughs> You are muted, Doctor. You're muted, Doctor Sam. You, Doctor Sutherland, you are muted. Am I? Can you hear me now? What yes, is going on? Okay, 2024, lovely. I'm thinking of the parent who loves a child unconditionally, but still has expectations of obedience, etc. And so I'm hearing you, and that is the simplest example I can think of. Um, and it is the same thing with God, right? He loved us so much, as you said, that he gave his son, but he, he didn't give it to us just so that we could have grace to do what we want. With that love, um, there, there are some deliverables on our part. And so, you know, we always say that we should not take grace for granted or we shouldn't take, you know, the, the, the pardons that God um, takes us for granted. So Pastor Samuel. Yeah, I, I agree totally. And I think it is so important to communicate and to make known what those expectations could be. And I think if we approach a romantic relationship, letting the other party know how much uh, my my desire is to love you and to relate to you and not to control you. And mm -hmm. just to let you know in, in, in having this relationship, I, I mean, I would like, you know, to be understood and to be heard when having that relationship and, and and to be respected and and you know beginning by sharing how I feel what I bring it to, bring it to the table and trying to understand what they have to offer and how we can mutually walk it together with the understanding of, of what is required from God's word and what are we willing it to do what are we committing ourselves to and how far are we willing it to go to ensure we love and take care of each other so that there is no uh, assumption? Because oftentimes when it's not communicated, we assume you should know or we assume you should understand. And so I think it's important for clear communication early so that mm -hmm. persons know where we're heading, what we want to do, what we want to achieve and what we want to accomplish. And by sharing each other's heart, we will learn more about each other and learn how we can proceed it together with some knowledge as to what God expects of us from his word and what we can expect from each other by what we are willing to commit to. So I love that because it segues completely into the next part, right? I'm hearing you say what God expects and what we are going to be committed to do or what we expect of each other, what we are committed. So I'm laughing in my head because I already, you know, topic one is, is hitting me for six. Because uh, <laughs> you said, make no assumptions and clearly communicate. I think I'm yeah. an excellent communicator, but not necessarily in relationship. So my next question then, can you list a few expectations that you would consider appropriate before committing to a relationship? I think for me, like I shared earlier, I will think mutual respect. Okay. I respect one for the other. And I also would like to suggest um, 
allowing each other to be heard even when they're not fully understood. Because if I'm if I'm dismissed, I think I don't matter. And if I'm heard, I, I, I believe I'm considered by you. So allowing each other to be heard, even if they're not fully understood. And um, I, so I think those are two that I believe feel strong about respecting right. and being heard and, 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 and making sure you are prepared to meet each other's need to the best of your ability. I'm willing to take care of you to the best of my ability and communicating that. I think those are some basic things that one should and I think if I should add a fourth one, uh, a good understanding of God's word, a good understanding of God's word, having an expect, expectation of such so that we can base our future and base our decisions and our values out of that perspective. So we know if we have a healthy understanding of God's word, those are some things we can expect to work from. I love that. Can I ask the members of, of the, well, we say audience, but the participants, do you want to just drop in what you think is a is an expectation that you would consider appropriate before committing to a relationship? When I think of the expectations to Pastor Samuel and Bishop Gary, I'm, I'm thinking of like those um, core principles, you know, almost like my non-negotiables. But I love that you say being heard, even if not fully understood. And I think being heard is so much different to just listening to the person speaking, right? And I'm, I'm walking through that now. I, I have, uh, my husband says, you're hearing me, but you're not listening. And I'm like, but I am listening. This is what you're saying. And he's like, no, that's not what I'm communicating. So thank you because I'm, I'm, I'm walking through this and I love mutual respect, right? And the fact that even though people might have expectations of us, a, a lot of times, we love people the way we want to be loved and not necessarily in the way that they want to be loved. So mm -hmm. being heard may not be important to me, but if it's important to you, it is a matter of having a good understanding of how I show up for that other person. So Bishop Gary, over to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, there is, um, again, I, I love the aspect of Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, where Paul says, let us speak the things that become sound doctrine. You know, and sound doctrine for him was not the astrology and Christology as much as it was the principle of the family, which lays the foundation for kingdom living. Um, so that when a person understands the relationship between a man and his wife, then you understand it's between Christ and the church. Then you understand the Bible says, let accept the Lord build the house, the laborer work it but in vain. Now, which house is he talking about? He's talking about your house, but the house of the Lord also. And then he said, except the Lord, uh, watch the city, the watchman work it but in vain. In a sense, so the house that, that develops into a proper house, Proverbs 31, becomes one where they have influence in the city, which is essentially Abraham looked for a city whose build and foundation was God. New Jerusalem represents the city. And all these different theological dimensions now for me when it comes to the aspect of preparation it's a discussion and purpose orientation i mm -hmm. to me once a relationship is not based upon purpose then you it, it's open to the vulgarities of, of of society and life and um so if you have a purpose oriented and and you explain that okay we are patriarchal we are biblical that you understand that you know the, the the wife must submit to the husband, but the husband must give him give her something to submit to. The Bible says, "Make it fit for thyself in the field, and afterwards build thy house." The problem again in our society is that we have not spent a lot of time teaching our young people, male and female, their roles and responsibilities, and how to interrelate to each other. In fact, one of the most powerful sermons that Jesus ever spoke. And Jesus seemed to save his best the ones for one person. In John chapter 3, he spends the time speaking to Nicodemus about the kingdom of God and being born again. They will just see it. But in chapter 4, he takes time to speak to the widow, the sorry, the woman at the well. And why does he, he ask a, a question that seems to doesn't dominate the, the subject when he says, uh, go call your husband? And she says, well, I have no husband. He says, you've spoken well because you've had five. And the one that you have now, you're renting. Um, <laughs> it's not yours. 
And what he was trying to get to, the reason why he did that is because the problem of humanity is connectivity. The problem of humanity is communication. The problem of humanity is, is the lack of community. And that can only be built when we have solid love and we have solid expectations. So that the biggest problems that happen between most of our, in our relationships is because we did not have our expectations clear. Mm -hmm. you know, and, oh, you signed up for something that you didn't know that you, you signed up for a war that you didn't know existed. You know, that? Or you signed up. And again, so if there is not the sharing and a maturity to share your expectations in the relationships, then you can find yourself nursing grudges and anger to work to each other, um, having never shared mm -hmm. those particular realities. You understand? So we must understand love languages, his name and and their and their di and their dialects. You understand? Because it's not just a matter of communication, but how do you need to be communicated to? Not just a matter of physical touch, but how do you expect physical touch? You understand? So there are all sorts of di um, dialects that goes into these things. And then there's the understanding of the his needs, her needs. And um, if you're really going to go into deep, deep love, the understanding your spouse's history and the traumas they went through is extraordinarily important because sometimes we marry people and they've gone through certain things that almost prevent the development of certain aspects of their being. And mm -hmm. these are things that have to be taken into consideration if we're going to have lasting loves. Because... Um, all right, let me, let me stop for there. Let me stop there for that. <laughs> no, I I feel like you can keep you can keep going. I see some hearts going up. You're getting some good reaction, guys. Put what your your expectations are or what they were before marriage, and if if those expectations have changed. And I think it's important to go slow on this, right? Because oftentimes we go through counseling and we're like, okay, good, we're we're ready to go. And what I love is that you talk about trauma there. When I tell you, you all are speaking to me tonight, you all are speaking to me tonight. History and trauma on both ends, love languages, who likes gifts, who wants affection and time spent. Guys, go out and get the book and, and read it. And then sometimes people enter. I love when you, you started, Bishop Gary, you talked about you know, purpose orientation for marriage. And there's a fantastic question coming out from, from what you said there. But before I get to that question, sometimes you have that purpose, but then you you get lost along the way and we have to go back to, you know, reiterating what the expectation along that marital journey is about. Um, so some good food. Um, the, the question that I want to bring to you, how practical is it to marry for God, kingdom and duty? That's the question in the chat. How practical is it to marry for God, kingdom and duty? If love and marriage go together, why is there so much divorce in the West? And I think you kind of touched on it when you spoke about perversion, but Bishop Gary, I'm going to come back to you. How practical is it? Um, again, um, Love is of God, and who that loveth not knoweth not God. <laughs> God is love. And again, part of the reason since we have gone away from God, that's one of the reasons I accept that we have that problem. You know, um, the kingdom of God, which is the, the, the God's way of doing things, and that's one of the simplest expert a simple explanation of it. It's not a complete explanation of things, sir, but a simple explanation of the kingdom is God's way of doing things. If we go about things the way that God does, then the way that God does it is with the end in mind. All right. The Bible says so where there is no vision, the people perish. But happy is he that keeps the law so that for, where there is no vision for your family, then your family is open to the vulgarities of time and chance. And yeah. then secondly, there's a law to every vision. All right. So now I know that the, when we read that many times, we just think, you know, it's the law, meaning um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, etc. But I also want you to know there are laws to your vision. So there's some biases that developed in your family that you must develop in your personality or in your family if you understand that this is the purpose of God in your life. You understand? So when I began to understand as a young person that, okay, there's an orientation towards, for me personally, to dealing with Africa, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and God was putting that in me, um, I had to develop certain skills to be able to handle that. You understand? Um, and... Uh, so I eventually married a thank God an African woman, all right, woman from Africa, literally, and um, 
But again, orient, the more you begin to understand what your purpose is, see, you see, if your purpose is to win souls in China and your wife's purpose is to win church, church people, souls in India, you're going to have to make love in the Indian Ocean, right? <laughs> you're going to have, you're gonna have different foci, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why you don't marry based upon the lust of the eyes. The lust of the they might awaken love in you, but then you have to confirm it by knowledge. You understand? Mm -hmm. So um, I've had people that I've seen, but when I started getting close to them, I couldn't marry. I couldn't marry them because they did not they did not have certain orientation inside of them. They did not have certain directions. They couldn't submit to certain directions, etc. Um I can't say that I was perfect in doing that, etc. But I can tell you, um, you know, as I said, 2020, hindsight is 2020. <laughs> and it, it goes like this experience is the greatest teacher because a fool can learn no other way. So mm -hmm. people get the opportunity to learn from my foolish mistakes. <laughs> and those of us who are willing to share with other people. So I'm not speaking like this because I, I am perfect, but I'm speaking like this because of the pains I've gone through to understand that once you and your spouse have different orientations and mm -hmm. different directions, so that the Bible says, what fellowship um, uh, what fellowship between light and darkness, temple of God and and, and Belial and, and idols and etc. A believer with an unbeliever. You understand? I've seen people who've tried, you know, the bishop, I love the man, and they marry an unsafe man, and they found out that their father in law was Satan. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, etc. So it's an extremely important, and I think it's very practical for the kingdom of God. If you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are very, very practical um, teachings. The kingdom of God is not just a spiritual, um, conceptual something, you know? It's a practical thing in terms of doing dealing with forgiveness. You can't have if you know, um, you, 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 you <laughs> I want to say something at the same time, I forgive me, all right? And again, again, now the problem again, I found for me with, with counseling is that I have only had one couple, I think. I've married about 120 something couples in my 35 years of pastoring. And I think it's only one couple that decided to call it off during counseling. Everybody else, by the time they come to you, they don't want to hear, they're not willing to hear anything you have to say. They're just looking for a rubber stamp to move on, you know? Mm -hmm. And therefore, mm -hmm. I think it comes from the pulpit and the teaching of the pastors and things like this before people get themselves caught up with love. Because I think just like how Adam went to sleep when God decided to give him a spouse, most people, when they fall in love, they fall asleep too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and only, the vulgar, only the vulgarities of marriage wake them back up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you you getting some some serious reactions here, <laughs> Doctor Samuel? Coming to you. Yeah, I mean something that he said was so so profound that people may awaken love in you, but you need knowledge to be guided in that process, and I think. Even the Bible talks about, you know, a husband living with their wives according to knowledge. And it's so important for us to know certain things and to be aware and to take time to understand because what you feel is, is one thing, but knowing how to go about living and how to apply truth to situations is a, is a different thing. So when people don't take time to understand that God has an idea and the ideal model for how we should be in marriage, I mean... The, and then the mere fact Ephesians talks about how husband ought to be to the wives and how wives ought to be to the husband. It tells us that God has some insight into human desires and human behavior. And he put things in place to guide us that way so we will, you know, meet those needs and satisfy, you know, the desires and the things that will make it solid and strong. So when he talks about how husbands should love their wives as themselves and wives should submit to it, it just tells you how God understands so much about us. Yeah. But we perhaps don't even understand anything about ourselves. And if we are guided by what God says, it means we can fulfill and achieve and have that ultimate success and recognize that kingdom matters. And, and like Bishop says, God's way of doing things should matter to how we do things. Yeah. Because that's what you guided, yes. 
thing that matters and, and, and that's it. Marriage is not just for us to feel good with yeah. each other, but it is a reflection of how Christ loved the church and it's a reflection of what God expect, expected, just going back to that word. Um, so let's 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 come back to expectations and let's use a, a Caribbean example, right? If I am getting married, says most men, my wife should be a good cook and a housekeeper. <laughs> Bishop Gary is laughing already, right? Only to get into the relationship, having not said that was the expectation and realized, well, she was quote unquote a modern woman and expected him to do the cooking. How should we manage our expectations in a relationship? We're here already. We didn't listen to Bishop Garraway because we already paid the caterers and we already rented out the hall. So now we're married and oh my goodness, there's no refund. Nobody's cooking. What do we do? How do we manage? And you know, it's, it's a, we can laugh at that, right? But this causes serious problems. Simple expectations not met. Um Cause, cause big problems in relationships and in marriage. How do we manage our expectations in the relationship? Would you like to touch that, me? Eh? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, with, my, with many tears, you, you, gotta, you have to understand that disappointments in life, I think God has kept us certain dimensions of disappointment because disappointments allow you to, it tests your faith, it tries your faith, and it gives you a doorway back to God. So sometimes after you learn everything and all the principles, etc., you still have to understand mm -hmm. that, you know, one of the things that a Hebrew man was required to teach his sons, he was required to teach them seven things. And the last thing was how to swim. And the reason why is because two third, three quarter of the planet is made up of water and we don't have gills. And therefore, three out of four steps are likely to bring you to some dimension of disappointment. So that part of your preparation for life should be how to handle disappointments. And you should do that with, one, forgiveness, but two, confrontation. All right? So those two things go together. Now, for anybody who took time to go through the basics, which, again, is in Titus chapter 2, the mm -hmm. Bible says one of the qualifications that the younger, older women will teach younger women is to is oikos, or to take care of the family, take care of the home. Etc. And um, I, I, the thing about it is that the, the honest truth is that men are not really impressed by women economic achievements. We're not impressed by your scholastic abilities. We're not impressed by how much money you make. You understand? None of those things are the essence of femininity. The essence of femininity. When God broke the responsibilities of male and female in 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 in, in um, Genesis chapter three, He says, "You're gonna have pain in conception." You will mm -hmm. try to rule your husband, otherwise you're going to be there as a backup mindset, etc. A manipulation that to some degree, and I'll answer that and do that later on. Mm -hmm. And he said, but the husband will rule in the end. And then on the second side, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, he says, curse is here for thy sake, turn the tissue shall bring forth to you. So that work was given more to man. And again, if you are traditional, then you should be looking for a traditional woman. All right. And again, we say traditional. I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to say biblical because we have a lot of women here. And I know you. Um, 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 <laughs> you know, but um, it, 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 let me start. I don't know. Maybe one of these days we'll probably discuss that aspect of the traditional. Yeah. Role. You know, I always remember coming back um, from a conference. I was up in business class at the next to um, Atlanta, one of, one of these big oil companies. Um, a human resource manager and she said to me she said um she said uh um you know when i spoke to other women mentors and they said when they reached the top up there they realized it's a boy game and they waste their time if they think they would spend more of the energies and, the, and dealing with their families and she said if my husband we actually called the exact figure if he could only work for so much so much money i would leave my job <laughs> you know but then you see but then what happened is that we have not taught the men that proverb for 24, 27, make it fit for thyself in the field and afterwards build thy house. So we not really were supposed to even go take wives until we establish a certain dimension of economics in our life. Mm -hmm. You understand? And, mm -hmm. um, and again, maybe again, uh, later on, in another program during the year, we probably take that up. But the whole aspect of communicating um, your, your, your disappointment is something that you need to do in your relationship but what you're told 
Mm-hmm. And as I'm, I realize it's not so many times the fact that you disagree with your spouse, but the tone in which you speak to your spouse. And if you become conscious of the tone in which you speak to your spouse, you can achieve many, many things. You understand? And um, but if 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 and I think that that's one of the dimension that we show love because rebuke is a serious dimension of divine relationship. You know, think about the Ten Commandments: Thou shall not, thou shall not, thou shall not. Thou. <laughs> In the Ten Commandments, God said, "Thou shall not" about nine times. You know, and mm-hmm. um, so that it flows with love. But the tone in which we do it, I think, is an extremely important thing. So nobody is required to, to do without what they need. And um, and again, we are making a presumption that the need here is lawful, biblical, etc. You know, and if it goes outside of that parameter, then we need we need healing. Because there's a there's a there's a little piece. You see that thing with the traumatized spouse? That is a serious thing at one day, at one day we probably need to know we need to touch that. Because yeah. what happens, we have people who are coming out with unreasonable demands in their relationship um, because of the fact that they have not they have not been healed before yeah. they get into the relationship. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. I hope that helps. <laughs> there, there's so much there to, to unpack before I get to, to Dr. Samuel, right? I, I like the idea of traditional and on how, how nice you, you know, you placated that impending argument. But it is true. I have a friend that I spoke to today and, you know, she was saying she believes she's convicted. She's not saying that the Bible com- commands this, but she's she's convicted that she's meant to speak, but that her ministry is to speak to women, Right. Mm. Though that's a very contentious um verse in the Bible where they say, you know, women should be silent, etc. And different people have different convictions about it. And I do think we perhaps need to bring some clarity on how we navigate some of these contentious scriptures that have implications for us in marriage. I like the fact that you said um working in the field, right? And then building your home. Um, one of the conversations we often have in, in our household is that of necessity, women are working. Because like you said, I think if if all men were able to put all the bills and, and all the expectations on their own, I, I don't think that a lot of women would actually want to go outside of the house and work, you know, to, to, to supplement that income. That's debatable. I am one of those. I just want to write and do this program and do DIY projects, right? But of necessity, we're, we're sharing those bills. Um, and I love the fact that you speak about the traumatized spouse because oftentimes, or in, in society now, when you look at the divorce rates and the reasons for divorces, it is not so much that is um irreconcilable differences, but it is just that there are things that we hadn't confronted. And I love how you speak about what your tone, you know, and I'm speaking to myself here as well, because sometimes... You have good intentions, but what you say is not being heard by the other person because of the way in which you say it. So some 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 really good nuggets coming through there, Bishop Gary. Pastor Samuel, should I expect that my husband should cook and clean and let me go out and work? <laughs> How do I manage? I don't know. <laughs> and I think that's where it's important to have conversation. That's why it's important to sit back if that discussion didn't happen before and now you're experiencing, I mean, you have to go back to the drawing board and and, and look at what should be considered. Perhaps we go back to Ephesians where the Bible gave us the insight like, like we said earlier about what is the expectation of a husband or a wife, trying to understand from God's perspective and then ensure that we're not unreasonable because there has to be some, if at this point in time we haven't really communicated what we should have and now we're here and there's expectations on both sides and then we have to have a conversation and we have to have some kind of forgiveness and compassion like we shared earlier to kind of sit down and say, listen, this is where we are. Mm-hmm. Clearly we missed something and you know we did not discuss something so we have to go back at the drawing board. And maybe we might need some intervention, you know, mm-hmm. a, a perspective as to how we can start to look at what is needed for where we are as a couple. And I think um, that's a way to start to deal with those things. And because maybe, because culture play a big role also 
in expectations and sometimes people have expectation based on their past relationships and they bring that past expectation where things failed or or where things worked and all they're bringing that into this relationship and maybe you were um his family he's used to his family the, the big family um planning and very family oriented and then lots of family event and she comes from a family where it's quite different they just mm -hmm. spoke you know you know and they need to you know not very often and, and for his very smaller family and now they have come together and he's expecting her to now be in all the family events and to keep up with all the family traditions and that can make her feel uncomfortable because i mean this is not how i grew up and this is not what i this is overwhelming so i think really sitting down and understanding some things about their culture about their you know their life and their and their past and and the, just to see if the expectations are unreasonable unrealistic and then see what should they measure the expectation against mm -hmm. and use the word of god as a gauge this is where we can start this is what god expects of us in a marriage are we willing to submit it to this and work through this so we can then, you know, come to a common understanding of maybe this is a gender role, or we see this as a gender role, but are we reasonable in the case because we're both working and can we make some decisions where yeah. I can sit and cook and, you know, all stuff. So you can work through. So I think conversation yeah. and really, but the way we connect, it, it must not be harsh and judgmental and accusing, but it's more of trying to be compassionate and understand, trying to have conversation to see where we miss it. Mm -hmm. And how can we now begin to look at what can work for us? Not what I want, not necessarily what you want, but what's best for this relationship. Because sometimes we look into what I want, what you want, what's right, what's wrong, who's right, who's wrong, as opposed to what's best. Can we consider something that, we, that is best for us going forward so that way you can start to see the expectations are working with the best interest of the marriage and not the best interest of the individual in the marriage wow again so much wisdom there i like um i like the, the, the word intervention because a lot of times especially as christians we think even though it's something positive we think we shouldn't want an intervention or then people go to counseling you know that means it's beyond Whereas if you if you go to counseling, it might actually help stop going over the, the yeah. cliffs. I love that. I love that culture affects expectations and we need to ensure that our expectations are not unreasonable or unrealistic and that we should measure those expectations, especially as Christians, against the word of God. So are we measuring it against what God wants us to do and that purpose vision that we have for the marriage or are we measuring it by gender rules and what we see on TV? And are we being unreasonable in our expectations? So when you were saying that, um, Rev, I was thinking, you know, I cook, you clean, you know, I wash, you iron. And it, as you said, it was what works for us. So Jean and, and Pearl might have Pearl doing everything at home, even though they both work. But in yeah. our dynamic, it may not work for us. So we have to sit down, as you said, and have that conversation about what works and then understanding God's perspective. And, you know, it may not be that I get my way or you get your way, but we get something that assists the relationship. Fantastic. Um, we have another question. As children of the kingdom, do we teach and subscribe to a tradition that more or less guarantees success in relationships and marriage as children of the kingdom do we teach and subscribe to a tradition that more than less guarantees success in relationships and marriage i'll ask any of you to, to comment I think, I think we can learn things as long as it assist us in maintaining our values and it is it, consistent with our values if i'm understanding the question correctly yes bishop because i mean um most importantly is what am i learning does is it um, consistent with 
my values, anything to take me away from that, I should be careful of. So I'm not too sure if the person is asking um, what um, information that is not necessarily biblical or am I correct to assume that or is, is it? Yeah, I'm going to ask the person to um to to clarify. Um, yeah, because I mean, I guess I well, my interpretation is is what we're teaching about marriage something that that guarantees success, or is it contributing to the high levels of divorce that we're seeing? That was my interpretation. But, but I'm going to ask the participant to yeah. um, to clarify. So in the meantime, then, um, while while we wait on on him to clarify or her, um. Let's go into something Bishop Gary talked about earlier. It is my way or the highway. <laughs> 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 Let's talk about the desire to control. I don't, be I don't believe in that. I believe that we need to see, as, you know, I guess at different phases of your life, you'll see certain things is more important, you know? So for me, before I got married, um, I had certain discussions with my wife. I don't cook, I don't clean, I don't wash. That is what I'm saying. Um, but I handle all the bills. I will handle 115% of all the bills. All right. Um, however, I understood that my particular wife had certain economic plans and she had certain skills in her. And once she begins to activate that, you can have as many maids as you want. All right. So, but there's a building process into the whole thing. You know, there's a there's a wisdom that goes into the whole acting that makes it viable. All right. So as a young couple. Um, you may not be able to do certain things. You may have to understand certain realities. Um, it's just like, again, if you're coming from a traditional standpoint, prime prime economic responsibilities laid upon the male person. Um, however, if your wife is helping you in that area, then you should be willing to help her back in the area. You know, In fact, they say men get more um, special time if they help their women uh, um, with the with the household chores, et cetera, all right? But again, that's from that dimension. Because if your husband is handling all the economic aspect and then you still want to, all you want to do is watch TV, et cetera, then he has picked badly, you know? The man has picked badly. <laughs> <laughs> because the virtuous woman is a woman who is, um, she's time-oriented, all right? She, she has that understanding of uh, being the glory of the man. You understand? Mm -hmm. So, um, etc. Now, as far as the question that was asked, that we're still waiting for our beloved brother to complete its family values, sometimes versus kingdom values. And sometimes we have to say that our family is the best gift we ever get from God, but sometimes it's the biggest problem we ever get from God. Because train up a child in the way he or she should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. So you see mommy did something, daddy did something, and then guess what? That's your template for living. But it may be against the king, may not, it may not um, sync with the kingdom template. And this is where the renewed mind comes in and the strength of the pulpit. Mm -hmm. And so in our generation, what we found is that they are ve you, I, now I keep telling people, as I make the mistake and say, nobody preaches it. And not that nobody preaches it, I guess I'm not in the place to hear it. But I've not heard of a sermon on why some um, uh, obey your own husbands, that the word of God will not blaspheme. I've not heard a sermon on that in the last 25 years. Now, it may have happened in Pastor Samuel, jo Samuel Church. <laughs> 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 but your church, and I was not wrong, you understand? But because the, you are now, con it's considered toxic masculinity to have such discussions, <laughs> you understand? And we have got to understand that some things are not just based on culture, but some things are based upon a kingdom prerogative, you know, and um, et cetera. So we need to consider certain factors uh, because now what we have is a generation of young men who are not interested in getting married. You understand? You have Magta, men going their own way. Magta or something. So Magta, there's a whole movement consider that, you know, they're just not interested in getting married because the women are too problematic. It is then, and then you have a whole bunch of sisters who's talking about they can't find men, etc. And so you have these guys who are so gentle and gentle, Jesus, meek and mild. And then you have these warrior women like Zena walking around the church. <laughs> <laughs> um, something has to be done. <laughs> Just to bring her balance because 
Sometimes I can understand why the guys are afraid. You know, what I, mean? I can understand why they're afraid. And and then society now, you know, they almost penalize you for every good thing that you do. <laughs> you know, you could have your your economics could be could this could go from 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 millions to zero with the stroke of a pen and the slam of a hammer. <laughs> So again, we've got to come to the point of conditioning, and I think it's extremely important in the midst of all the other doctrines and things that we teach. Even though I'm known for teaching very heavy in the area of finance, etc., I do take some time to talk in this particular arena and go deeply into it to try to one challenge the female in my congregation, and two to challenge the men also. I want the men to come up and be strong, but I want them to be conscious. And I want the women to retreat a little bit and be healed. <laughs> that is that so that they could find their prime function because their prime function is to be a help meet. You understand to be a help meet. You understand not to dominate, even though no, I, I, I don't think we have a feminist program here. <laughs> it's not about the same I create a problem, but God didn't create why God created us equally in terms of love for him and the ability to communicate with him and the ability to express him. God gave us the different functions. Mm -hmm. And I've yet to find a sit down with a woman who has taken over control of the house and is happy. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's not the position she was created for. You know, right. so that in love and in expectation, it has actually been inbuilt in us. And it's activated through the love of God and our synchronism with the word, you know. So as the more we get into that, the more we're going to find ourselves having a greater dimension of happiness. And and and, and let me just say this, and this might really sound a little contradictory here, but the Bible didn't really make marriage for happiness. The kingdom of, in the kingdom of God is in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So if the mm -hmm. woman already has joy in the Holy Spirit, you know, because many times women walk away from their husband saying, I'm no longer happy. I no longer they said, Look, you're looking for things in marriage that God didn't put there. You know, mm -hmm. it's supposed to be two people who are walking in right thinking, right feeling, right acting, and you know, who are in is in the peace and steadfast prosperity of God, who is also walking in the in the joy of the Lord and coming together to fulfill what they believe is a common direction that God has given to them. But sometimes the woman having greater strength, sometimes the man having greater strength. But then when I give my, I push my wife forward because she obviously has the expertise in that particular arena. I am not going to try. My wife speaks five languages. I can hardly speak one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. something I don't try to push. It is that, but I submit and I, I'll gently prod her in those particular arena, and I will listen and try to to glean wisdom from her in that particular arena, etc. But final decision, God says, belong to me, in a sense, but I exercise it with her counsel. Yeah. I think there is so important, sorry, Pastor Samuel, before we come to you, um, I think, again, mm -hmm. back to, I think what um, Dr. Samuel said earlier about balance, right? That's so important because I think if we recognize that we both have uh, a purpose within marriage, going back to that purpose statement, that vision statement for yourselves and for your spouse and having those conversations before, like you said, um, Dr. Samuel, we can avoid a lot of these things. So I just want to slow down again um, for everyone on the program to talk about um, when last have we preached about wives will be your husband, especially in, 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 a, in a society or in a world where most of our practices kind of go contrary to what you know, the word teaches us as disciples. I like, again, the balance factor, right? We submit to our husbands, but it doesn't mean we subject ourselves to abuse. And you said it earlier, Bishop Gary, we have to have something to submit to. But if yes. we understand that singles come to, to, to the church on a taught how to live godly lives, by the time we get a decision of entering a relationship, we should have already worked through a lot of those things. So if you haven't, perhaps we do like what you said, that that one couple that that put a stop to the marriage because they realized we had something to, to work on. And then even as women are supposed to submit to their husbands, I'm hearing that husbands still have an obligation to be gentle in the way they deal with their wives. So it is not women submit full stop. There's a reciprocity that's happening that benefits both persons. 
and and understanding our functions, right? To be the help meet. Help meet doesn't mean you're the footstool or the doormat, right? So our interpretations of those things need to go back to what, again, both of you, Bishop Gary and Dr. Samuel says, measuring all these expectations against the word of God. And then I love what you said. That's something that I now need to go and think on. Righteousness, peace, and joy is found in the Holy Ghost and not in the marriage, right? So why are we looking for things in marriage that God didn't intend or God didn't put there? So I, I'm hoping that everyone on the call is getting as much as I'm getting out of this tonight. I think if if we started to slow slow things down a bit and really um reflect, on the, the true meaning of some of these passages it would save us a lot of, of heartache. So Dr. Samuel, come in to you. My way or the highway, how can we manage? Um, well, how can we use our expectations, I should say, to produce stronger relationships? And then we have two questions in the, the chat. Yeah, and because I mean I I love, I really love um when Mr. Gary was talking about something we look to the marriage for the joy, the righteousness, the peace and the joy in the marriage and not in the Holy Ghost. And if we as individuals really take time to grow in our relationship with the Lord, we're supposed to have that experience outside of marriage. So when we do get married, just to compliment, because there are some things I believe only God can provide. And there's some things family, parents provide, and some things friendship. And sometimes we go into a relationship expecting this person to provide the things that should have been provided in those other places. And here there is unrealistic expectation because what God was meant to provide, we expect a spouse to provide, and that's not realistic. Mm -hmm. And the list goes on. And sometimes I think it's 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 really, you know, I I read something that says control is when you leverage the strength of your position or personality against the weakness of someone else in order to get the person to meet your selfish agenda. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And you know, and when we lose that goal of relating, then control gets into the space. And rather than walking through and communicating, we now begin to make demands. And in making demands, we are going against God's agenda because God doesn't want to control us. God wants to lead us, to guide us, because God is interested in relationship, right? Not dictatorship. Correct? So mm -hmm. I believe somehow when we move away from God's idea, control is what kicks in as opposed to relating. And then that breeds unhealthy communication or unhealthy expectation, I should say. And we're able to achieve more when we really understand God's perspective, what God wants for us as individuals. I need to have that, and I, that is so profound, and I want to say it over and over again, I need to be satisfied with God first, because only in God I'm fulfilled, in marriage I'm complete, yeah? You know, God can use, or, 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 or the other around, however you want to say it, but God is the one who really gives us all that we need to be complete in ourselves. And you give us a spouse to assist and to help and to guide. And um, yeah, but Bishop Gary just gave us all. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to say a whole lot more because so much is still ready to unpack. But I just want that truth to keep resounding in our minds. Marriage is not going to give me what oh God. God is supposed to give me. And if I go into marriage having this expectation, I am being unrealistic and I'm being unfair to this person, hoping they will give it to me, but only God can. And if I don't sort that thing out in my own private time with God, I'm going to make my spouse or my relationship miserable and toxic. Because even though I don't understand what I'm dealing with, all I know is I expect this from you. Not realize things only God can meet that need. Wow, I love it. Let me push that a little further, Doc. Let me push that a little further. That sometimes yeah. men are wrong, all right? And yeah. um, there are people who, there are women who God bless who disobey their husbands. But the principle must be obedient to your husband. Like Rebecca, if Rebecca didn't switch the sons, the father would have blessed the wrong child. 
Right. All right. He was about to bless Esau instead of Isaac. All right. Mm -hmm. If Abigail didn't step out to feed David and his men, her family, his her family would have been dead that night in mm -hmm. 1 Samuel 25. Um, Sarah was the one who suggested to get rid of Is Is um, Ishmael and her, his mother. Um, the And Mary didn't even have a Joseph around to say, do it, be it unto me. So divine purpose takes supremacy over everything. So there are times when sometimes, um, again, as I said, there, there may be disappointments that take place in the relationship. There are times when your wife might do something that, and down the road, my friend, she is right and you are wrong. You know, mm -hmm. But you have to be man enough to come to that point to understand that. But the normal protocols, etc., is that a woman should not make a man ashamed. You know, right. when I read that portion of scripture in, in, in Titus, where it says um, that the older woman must teach the younger woman to obey their husband, that the word of God be not blasphemed. For years, it worried me. I said, well, why would, the man of, why would a man blaspheme God's word if his wife doesn't listen? And then I, it was only when the Lord showed me, no, he wasn't talking about the husband. He's talking about people looking on to your marriage. When the wife doesn't demonstrate order, then she creates a problem because she yeah. trains up the children. And then she, remember Christ's relationship with the church is what is demonstrated in the husband and wife relationship. So when yeah. the Muslim is looking on, the unsafe person is looking on, and they see your wife functioning without any order or due consideration or honor for the husband, then it brings black hmm, them as Christians, and that's the way they behave in. You understand? Mm -hmm. So that a woman must understand that her, her modus operandi must be one where she understands honor and order, love and loyalty. All right? Four very important words. If I, you know, I preached this to church once, what I'm about to say, and I think I got some big stone. All right? <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll take the risk. And I, when God brought the animals to, to Adam, the animal that prevailed wasn't the lion, it was the dog. All right? Because the lion would, a lion would eat you, but a dog is man's best friend. And the reason why the dog prevailed is because the essence of a dog is loyalty. Hey. You understand? The number one thing a man wants in his woman is loyalty. You understand? So sometimes when people want to call a woman by a dog name, they, they blast him in the dog. <laughs> I should not be laughing at that. I should not be laughing at that at all. Oh, here the part of get me in trouble. Here the part of really get me in trouble. Mm -hmm. you, can, but, you, but can I a, you can get a free dog for what for a dollar or a free dog for nothing. But the, the difference between a dog that is for free and a dog that is for ten thousand is that the ten thousand dollar dog can be trained. Yeah. The difference between a ten thousand dollar dog and a fifty thousand dollar dog is how quickly it can be trained, and therefore the Bible says, "When I'm the, the prime responsibility of a husband is to wash his wife with the water of the word, and therefore if a woman is unteachable or un and she cannot adapt, then she does not make a high quality woman or wife." And that's heavy. The that's heavy stuff. Heavy is, heavy, is, heavy is not the word, right? I, I see some people here putting up some nice emojis and I'm like, I don't know if I want to respond to that one. But I think I just need to sit down and make my notes and I need to go back and do some apologizing tonight. I think we make stone. <laughs> um, I think, I think we have to be careful also because... Okay. We can have expectation out of our own insecurities, and that's why people are very controlling in relationships. Yes. Because when our expectation is born out of our own insecurities, it can be a really difficult space. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, codependencies <laughs> are real in marriage. What the problem we're having now, Doc, is that they tell you 60% of all divorces are initiated by women. And if the woman, like our Dr. Frenier, has two degrees, it goes up to 80%. So that right now, according to statistics that is coming out, the people who is walking away from marriage are women. Yep. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. And part of the reason is because they can now get a paycheck and your house by keeping the children, and you have to go looking for pillar to post. <laughs> oh, my word. Bishop Gary, I don't know who lit a fire under you tonight. We, we're going to put that on pause, and we, I will respond to that in a different program. 
Um, I hope Pastor Henry's listening. Bishop Gary is in the naughty corner. <laughs> <laughs> so we are at the hour. Um, there's still one more question, but I wanted to get back to the the um the clarity that was provided in the Whoa. chat on the question of um are we subscribing to a tradition that guarantees success? He goes on to say what we practice seems to produce the same results in the church as in the Western world. So is it, I guess, is it a, a, ch a challenge with what we're teaching? Well, I mean, God's idea of how things should be is the perfect idea. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Yes. And okay. if we follow God's idea, it's guaranteed to work because God, is, it wasn't humanity who instituted marriage, it was God. Mm -hmm. Correct. And because God instituted marriage, he put the right components. He put, he has all the necessary things to make it work. Mm -hmm. But if we move away from God's idea and try to fulfill God's idea by our own, our own human intelligence, yes. then we miss, because sometimes we walk away with information, but not God's intent. Yeah. Mm. So we quote the scripture, we can say what the Bible says, but haven't captured God's heart. What was God really communicating? What did God mean when he said such and such? And so if we try to interpret God's world out of our own intelligence, we perhaps miss what God is communicating because God will not suggest something that is designed to fail. It fails when we fail. Hmm. Yes? Because yeah. God, if God expects something of us, it's because he has qualified us to achieve it. Yes. Uh, now, that, now that's well said, very well said. And then I agree with him. The Bible says in Hosea 4 6, that people perish not because of demons, not because of the change of generation, but because mm -hmm. of lack of knowledge. And because, and that's only one quarter of the verse, and because you have rejected knowledge, therefore I have rejected you from being priests, and I will not save your children. To the intergenerational problems that we're seeing, etc., it is because we have committed ourselves. You know, one preacher, crazy, crazy preacher, I think the guy very crazy. But he said something very good. He said there's a virus in our education system. You know what And I found there's some schools where, the, where some female schools where the teachers are actually telling the ladies, I am telling you this so that you don't have to listen to a man. I am telling you this so that you don't have to depend upon a man. And, and we, I mean, <laughs> we're the only species <laughs> you understand, that have gone away from our, our role in God, as it were, it is that, and um, there's a virus that exists there. And unless you meditate in the Word of God, the Word of God is perfect, converting the soul. That's what the Lord is sure making wise and simple. And until we get in to believing God's wisdom is beyond the world's wisdom, yep. then we can be Christians. We can be, I guess, wolves. We'll be sheep in wolves' clothing. <laughs> <laughs> getting a thumbs up. Getting a thumbs up. All right, so guys, we're gonna try to wrap up in oh. in about five minutes. Um, there's a comment, and then I just want to ask the last question that you'll use as your your closing statements. Um, someone asks, coming from different Pentecostal churches, and I guess I think this is a perfect segue into the last um question about uh, adjusting our expectations in a relationship. Right, what measure? should I use to ensure that what I come up with is appropriate? So kind of touching on what you said earlier, Dr. Samuel. Coming from different Pentecostal churches, how do my husband and I come to a middle ground where making our individual church the main one we attend? So I don't know if the person wants to unmute the mic to provide clarity or to type, um, are we understanding it clearly when you said you come from two different Pentecostal churches you need to come to a middle ground on which church becomes the main one that you attend. Um, I don't know if you want to give me a thumbs up if, if that was a good interpretation. Hold on. Let me look for the name. Coming from Hi, different good night. Thank yes, it is. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes? Okay. Hi, good night. Yes, it is. I'm not married, but I'm just saying, just in case ah. this comes up when I do get married. <laughs> Fantastic. So Thank you. want the clarity right now. Right. <laughs> So, yeah, go ahead, Dr. Samuel. I think it's a fantastic segue into that last question. Yeah, I feel Bishop Gary, um, I'll I, I pass it on to him. <laughs> I've seen this already in, in, 
church in my, in my 35 years of pastoring. First to begin, as a pastor, you're a female, you're getting married, I expect you to go. Children come to go. All right? <laughs> so I expect you as a female, and if the man's church is not good enough for you, you shouldn't marry that man because the philosophy of his pastor becomes a dry, a major artery of flow into the belief structure of your house. But I guess too, it is something that they can also sit and discuss. And I mean, I mean, that, I mean, I'm just saying, if it is, they don't feel they want to go the way that you are suggesting because some men might. You know what? I'll leave it yeah. alone. I'll leave it alone. I just no, no, but I, but, 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 I'm going to pick up there us. because what if what if we say, well, let's find a new church to go to? Yeah. No, 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 no. And it, this yeah. lady, I, I love the way she did it. She went again from a, a, our philosophy. She married a guy, went straight to his church. He stopped going to church. She come back. <laughs> I, but, I, I, you see, the head, of, the head of the man, the head of the woman, is the, the, the wife is the husband. The head of the husband is Christ. The head of Christ is God. Now, mm -hmm. please know the head of the man is not God. It's Christ, which is represented by the fivefold ministry. A large time, a large degree of a man's vision for life flows out of the pastor that he's under. And if a woman cannot submit to a man's vision, if a man, if he cannot submit to that man's pastor, I would suspect there's something a little offy there. And if the man is not willing to stand up for his pastor too, I would suspect his ability to give leadership to that woman also too. This well, is just <laughs> and, and 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 maybe yes, maybe no. I think <laughs> in some cases, but I think I will because there can be a situation where um is not necessarily that, and, okay. there be, and there might be other things to be considered. And that is the reason why communication expectations are expressed. And at some point in time, they can come to some understanding if in fact is not necessarily what you are describing, but there are other factors that needs to be considered. And they can, but the idea is, is they've been able to come to a mutual decision. Even if they agree, we're going to go to separate places. What? I'm just saying, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. I'm just saying, they have to sit back and see what's best for their relationship. Remember, I'm gonna set up what, for this thing for you, you know. No, 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 no. But, but you know, Dr. Uh, Dr. Samuel, I'm, I'm offering you some support there, even though you know maybe we're in the wrong. But I do know of a couple in our church where um, the guy is is a part of our one of our ministries, and his wife. Um, she actually goes to another church and they've been married for um teen years. Um, and, and there's nothing awry in the relationship as far as, as we know. They just say it works for them that way. But Gary is like, no, but um <laughs> but Pastor Griffith is Pastor Griffith wants to weigh in. Go ahead, Dr. Samuel, and then Pastor Griffith, and we have to leave. We told people one hour. Y'all are starting 2024. Wrong slash right because everybody's still here. Um, Dr. Samuel and then Pastor I think I will leave that up to the couple. I mean, even though it's from what Bishop is saying, it's ideal to do the model that the husband that the wife goes with the husband, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But I also believe there might be some other consideration made where the couple can have a, a, a discussion and they can clearly communicate what the expectations are, what works best for them, mm -hmm. and then understand God's direction in that decision. So uh, that is something I don't want to say it has to be this way or it has to be that way because it may not be the best. So I don't want to say it has to be this way. Which you, I will leave it up. I will still leave that up the shop <laughs> for discussion with the couple, okay, that right. they and sit back and negotiate that in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Pastor Griffith. Hi, good night. I think Pastor, um, Pastor um, the Samuel <clears throat> made a, a point that it is a matter between the couple. But I think that long before they come at expectation, where the couple are courting, they should know and decide because I believe that they are already going to 
separate churches. And there are people who can live with that. I would, however, say this one point, that that is one of the important matters that need come up front very early. Now, I remember when I was yet married, which is several years ago now, I had a, a friend. We were just friends, but good friends. Who knows where that relationship could have gone? Of course, a female. And But then she believed that we needed to go to church on, sun, on Saturday, and she believed that we need to be baptized in Jesus' name. And then one day I asked her a question. I said, tell me something, sister. When, if you and I were to marry and we got children, which church would our children go and how do we determine, how do we determine the, 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 the division? Mm -hmm. And she says to me, you know what? I never thought about that, you know. I just say that to say that I think that before you as a Christian going at two different churches, mm -hmm. agree that you all can partner together, start from the beginning, understanding the consequences and determine up front. I know your time is up, so I just pause there. Yeah. So um, we, we had a few jokes from one of the, the participants to go to her church. He would have to attend her church for one year with his pastor's permission, 75% minimum attendance before <laughs> marriage. Um, so I love that we can we can have some fun with the conversation, but we really did get some meat tonight. Um, so before I hand over to, to Bishop Gary and Reverend Dr. Samuel to give their final comments and then ask Pastor Henry to close out the program for us. Just want to remind you all that we spoke about the expectations of love tonight. The very fantastic conversation, um, the role that expectations play in a relationship, why we should verbalize our expectations to our lovers, perhaps before marriage or specifically before marriage and during marriage, the importance of appreciating expectations that are counter to what we expect and the importance of a set of common expectations based on our individual values. So, Rev, Samuel, you're closing. Yeah, uh, expectations are really a mental picture of the future. It is really giving someone something to look forward to. And that's why it is so important for us to really draw from God's word draw from God's mind how I ought to be as a person so when I connect with someone else I'm not just sharing from a selfish place but I'm sharing from a place of consideration mm -hmm. and a place where we can be guided into a secure future allowing you know, God's word to be really guided so I think it's really important for us to know what God expects and, and know how God would position me as a person and be mind flesh how I should treat with the person I want to love for the rest of my life. Bishop Carey. Amen. <laughs> In the Bible, <laughs> the God of peace is the one who bruises Satan under our feet. In the book of Romans. And therefore, peace is a very important part in a person's life to have developed that. And even when they're disappointed that they can handle it, etc. Um, one of the things that they did back in old Israel is that when the matchmaker found what was supposed to be a suitable bride for the for the gentleman they brought her into the into the garden of the gentleman's home and then the mother would come and lift the veil off her face to see whether her forehead was wrinkled it wasn't the wrinkled garments the bible was talking about it was the wrinkle it was the forehead when it was wrinkled because if she was young and it was already had wrinkled forehead it means she had a propensity to worry and she could not handle conflict etc because in our life, especially when they start putting strong people together, I remember the first time I met Pastor Anthony and we were walking the city and he told me one day, he said, what do I like you to come across and preach by me? I said, to preach what? <laughs> and I went to the list of doctrine and we were on different sides of the aisle and about so many different doctrines, but nobody could tell that, that we had those differences because what I saw in the man was a passion for Christ. You understand? And over time, you know, both of us may have changed this in arena, etc. And up to now, we're still very good friends. So that a person's ability to be able to maintain and to handle scenarios, it depends upon a certain level of maturity that must happen in them because disappointment would happen. The Bible says offenses have need but must come. And if, again, we don't prepare our children to swim, 
to handle that three out of four footsteps, then we are preparing them for doomed relationships, broken relationships. And again, I think the most important thing in life is relationship with God. Second most important thing um, is your relationship with people. And then the third and least important is your relationship with resources. It is And those three things, when you have those things in balance, you tend to be able to, to, be able to function, you know, in chapter three, the guy had to find out about the kingdom. Chapter four, the woman had to find out about connectivity. Chapter five, in the book of John, the reason why the guy stood there all those years by the by the by Beth Sitter pool is because he never developed a team. He did not have a team of people to put him in the water when the angel stood it up. And again, if we don't learn to handle relationships, we and by true love and true maturity, etc., and all these different things then we're going to find that a large part of our life will not be properly fulfilled. Again, thank you very much for the privilege to be here in this program this evening. Thank you very much for the time shared with um, Dr. Samuel, or Brother thank Samuel. You. God bless you. And you, ma'am, Dr. Sutherland. <laughs> Fantastic. I thoroughly enjoyed tonight. I think we're off to a banging start. I feel like we were a team of, of Shamar Joseph hitting for the West Indies team there, you know? <laughs> Golden, sorry, for the West Indies team. So, so... Pastor Henry, over to you. <laughs> I enjoyed I enjoyed being with Dr. Um, Sutherland or Bishop Guy. I really enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you as well. Pastor Thank Henry. you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sutherland. I <laughs> I would have been loved to be on the uh, program this evening <laughs> because I have <laughs> different a different viewpoint altogether than these two gentlemen. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's just so I, 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 for all the women who are on, I'm out there 100% behind you. <laughs> uh, the, the, the whole problem, as far as I see it, with the uh, with with this thing with women and men, mm. it's the oppression that we have placed upon our women over the years in the Western world. A woman was not allowed to hold a bank account as a married woman in her name until 1965. Wow. Just over 50 years ago. Mm. That has wow. been oppression. She could not. And when she was married, she had to keep that account in the husband. Whatever money she had had to be kept in her husband's name. And that wasn't mm. changed until 1965. Wow. Right? Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so the revolution continues, and the truth is, we men can't handle it. <laughs> next week, God's willing, we are talking about enjoying love. You have to be on the program next week, God's willing. Dr. Neff has just joined us. Dr. Neff is going to be our host next week, enjoying love, because love was meant to be enjoyed. Thank you very much, Dr. Sutherland. Next week at 7.30 p.m. And all of you who have joined, we are glad to have you on Real Talk. Bring a friend with you next week, God's willing. And uh, the Lord bless you richly, 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 richly. I think I have Dr. Nepp on spotlighted. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't be on earlier, but boy, the little, the little bit I got, <laughs> priceless. Guys, guys amusing and amazing all at once. Thank you. All right, okay, okay, Pastor okay. Francis is also on, and Pastor Constantine and, and okay. Pastor Griffin spoke earlier. So good night to you as well. Special good, good night. night. Thank you everybody for joining us. Praise and good night, everybody. Pleasant night. Good, good, good. Night. <laughs> great program. A great start to 2024. Thank, Thank you so much. What is it? Great use of the Maria part two is definitely needed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, Pastor. Good night. I'm listening to hear Pastor Henry's take on it. Yeah, I'd like to hear that. <laughs> that was a tease. That was definitely a tease. <laughs> yeah. This is getting it going. I'm key, I'm, I'm going to reserve myself a right down to the last program in this series. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Well, I'm glad I've I'm, I'm, I'm been listening for the rest of it. <laughs> that one is the evolution of love. Evolution. Yes. Uh... Good night to everybody on YouTube. Yes. You can.